a couple years ago, I had a laptop that had VGA, and it was always fun trying to get that to work. All right, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, auditing web-based or browser-based uh, password generators. Just a little bit of a warning. I have some explicit slides. I'm using memes from Effenbirds. So if you decide that vulgarity or profanity uh, is not for you, I will not be offended if you decide to leave. That's perfectly OK. Uh, otherwise, be prepared for my goddamn slides. Uh, first, a little bit of background. Um, I work for X Mission. It's a local ISP out of Salt Lake City. And about five or six, seven years ago, we hired a junior web developer fresh out of high school. And he was highly inexperienced. I mean, coming out of high school, I guess it's not too surprising. But he was also kind of cocky. And his first task was to develop a password generator for our customers. We have a control panel where they can manage their account, including changing their password. We wanted to provide a password generator in the web-based control panel, and so that was his first task. So he was asked to work with me. I have a background uh, in mathematics and cryptography, as well as security. So we were working on banging this out and getting this uh, working. And unfortunately, he wasn't listening to the math. I don't know what his mathematics background was, but I have a degree in mathematics. It's kind of my passion. And he wasn't trusting it. He wasn't trusting it. The math was holding up. And he trusted his intuition more. So we ended up banging heads and locking horns during this project. Regardless, though, we still ended up with a decent result. And this is a screenshot. If you go to xmission.com slash generator, you can toy around with it. Uh, but you're presented with 15 random words. You have to select at least three. Uh, and then you just click generate. And every time you click generate, a new password pops up beneath the one above it. And it also will um, separate those three words, or more if you choose more, with numbers and special characters. From the technical side of things, the words are coming from a word list of 11,121 words. And they're shuffled. And then we give you, say, the top 15 out of that shuffle. That means there won't be any duplicates right, in the, the presentation of the 15 words. You have to collect, select at least three. You can select four more if you want. And like I mentioned, the words are separated by digits and special characters, punctuation, symbols, whatever you want to call them. <clears throat> I'm only choosing 24 of them rather than the full set. Two digits have to be at least present in the result. We require at least two numbers. So from the lowest security margin, if the user only selects three passwords and the separated characters are all digits, we have four digits, then I can find out what the security margin is using the log base two function. So I can take the log base two of 11,121 times it by three for the three words, log base two of 10 times it by four, and I get about 53 bits of security. So the question is, is 53 bits of security enough? Is this giving me the necessary security for my customers? If you go to that URL, and I only created it for the slides. I'm not interested in tracking your clicks. Uh, so if someone wants to share the result with the rest of the class, that's perfectly fine. But if you go to tinyurl.com slash 8gtx1080, this is a GitHub gist, basically a, a large paste of a hash cache benchmark from professional password cracker Jeremy Gosney. And he's got eight NVIDIA GTX 1080 GPUs uh, that he's benchmarking with Hashcat. The fastest hash in his result is NTLM, no surprise. And those eight GPUs in concert can work through 513 giga hashes or 513.1 billion NTLM hashes per second, okay? So if my passwords were hashed with NTLM at X Mission, uh, what would those 53 bits of security provide my customers? Well, 513 billion hashes per second is effectively exhausting the key space of 38.9 bits of security every second. And I broke it down, you can see it by second, minute, hour, day, up to about 63.8 bits per year. Now, I'm assuming, in this case, that he's not blindly attacking 
the NTLM password hash, that he has a copy of the 11,000 words, he knows about the number and the character space separation, so he's got an accurate hash cache, hash cat mask for attacking these hashes, okay? He's not going at it blindly. So it would only take him about five hours to completely guess every possible combination of passwords that can be generated with this scheme. Five hours is not great. However, oh yes, I forgot the slide. So this is to my coworker. You should stay in school and remind me why I shouldn't just ignore your bullshit. However, XMission doesn't use NTLM. We don't use NTLM to hash our passwords. We use SHA-512 crypt, and maybe Pete doesn't appreciate me sharing that with you. Uh, but we use SHA-512 crypt with the default 5,000 rounds cost. Using that same GitHub gist that Jeremy Gaz Gosney provided with his eight GPUs, that same benchmark can only work through about 1,800, 1,850 kilohashes, or 1.85 million hashes of SHA-512 crypt per second, which is a far cry from the 513 billion NTLM we saw earlier, okay? So with this same setup then, he can only exhaust a full key space, again, using the correct hash cap mask, he can only exhaust 48.5 bits per year. To get up to that 53-bit benchmark, it would actually take him a full 32 years to exhaust the key space. So, fair enough. I will give credit where credit is due. It turns out that what we have for our customers is a decent result. It holds up. Okay. That got me thinking. Here we are working on this project for X Mission. What would I do for a personal project? If I were to design my own password generator and I would take my own advice that I was giving the junior developer when we were designing X Missions, what would mine look like, okay? What would my result look like? So initially I knew what I wanted. I wanted a reasonable default security margin, clearly defined, okay? That was, that was very important to me as a mathematician. But second, I wanted something clean. I wanted something clutter-free. I didn't want a lot of switches, I didn't want a lot of options, I didn't want to confuse people with the UI, which also meant that I wanted a pleasant user experience. I don't want to frustrate them in trying to generate a password. And I came up with some other ideas. Obviously, I'm gonna choose passphrases. So I probably wanna support multiple languages besides just English. Can I do that? Um, is there a way to do visual versus audible unambiguity? In other words, when I present a password, visually, is it visually distinct so there's no confusion as to what each character is? But further, what if I was in a noisy data center and I had to communicate that password to another system administrator? Can it be verbally distinct as well, so he's not confused that it could be another word or another character? So these are ideas that are working through my head. And also different memorability approaches. Can I present the password in such a way that it's easy to recall later, right? So it's time for me to do some market research. So the first thing is I did a DuckDuckGo search for secure password generator. And the first result is passwords, plural, passwordsgenerator.net. And this is a screenshot of that web page. This is exactly what I don't want. There's a lot of check boxes, there's a lot of text, uh, there's a, quite a few buttons. It just is a little overwhelming. To me, the text kind of blurs together and I just see this big wall of text. I'm not really interested or motivated to read everything. But one thing did catch my eye, halfway down those check boxes, that very bottom blue check mark says generate on your own device, otherwise do not send it across the internet. So this generator can either generate the password on the server and send it to your browser, or you could generate it locally in the browser and make the server ignorant of what you're doing. Why would I want the server to generate the password for me and send it? Why, why would I want that? So this is something I didn't consider when I began doing you know, some research into this. We'll still get a few others, some heavy hitters like LastPass. LastPass has a web-based password generator. Maybe some of you use LastPass. Um, this is their UI. It's a lot more clean. 
uh, less cluttered. The, the password is prominent, fewer check marks. Um, if I go back to the previous, I don't know if you can see right at the top, the default password length is 16. However, here the default password length for LastPass is 12. So which is better? Is the 16 characters better or is the 12 characters better? They're all using uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols. So why did LastPass go with 12 and this other developer is going with 16? Here is one password, even more clean. And what I like about this is they are color coding certain characters. Digits, the numbers zero through nine are blue. And if I had added symbols, those would be red. So visually, it becomes very clear to me that, oh, this is a zero and not an O. This is an L and not a one because the one would be blue, right? So visually I can look at that and know immediately what each character is. I kind of like that. Their default password length, however, is 20 without symbols. So is that something worth considering? Here's Bitwarden, another heavy hitter in the password manager space. They have a web-based password generator. I'm not a fan of their UI as much as 1Passwords or LastPasses. It's a little, maybe a little cluttered, a little spacious. Um, but they copied the same idea, color coding their digits as well as their special characters. Their default length is 14 characters. And then one more that came across my radar, which I kind of thought was kind of funny, is DinoPass, a password generator for kids. Now, why do kids get a different password generator than adults? Like, maybe the adult password generator could be profane and we don't want to put that in front of our kids, I don't know. But DinoPass just generates two random words, in this case, fuzzy and error, and then appends two digits at the end, and that's the entirety of the password. They have another button for generating a strong password, and that will randomize one of the word's first character getting capitalized, and then another character getting replaced with a visually similar symbol. Like for example, an S could be a five, or a T could be a plus sign, something like that, okay? So in terms of all these password generators on the web, security is defined in a number of different ways. We've got length, anywhere from 12 to 20 characters. Complexity, numbers, uppercase, lowercase, digits, punctuation. Bitwarden and 1Password also provide passphrase generators. So is the security the same for the passphrase generator as it is for the password? Then we also have audience which is something I hadn't considered until I stumbled on DinoPass. If a DinoPass password is not secure for an adult, why would it be secure for a child? That's an interesting question. So, as the bird says, I am in no mood for this shit today. So let's see if we can't make an attempt at a formal definition, okay? I am doing market research. Again, the whole motivation is for me to design my own. I don't like butting heads with my coworkers and coming up with something that I don't agree with 100%, right? So let's see if I can't make a formal definition before I start designing my own password generator. So that means I'm gonna start jumping into a slew of other generators and start auditing source code and learning from other people. I wanna see what they're doing. So I'm gonna be looking at their code and things stuck out immediately and we're gonna look at some examples here. We see uses of an insecure versus a secure random number generator when generating the password. We also see whether or not that generator is being used uniformly or in a biased approach. So let's look at four code examples and these all come from password generators that I audited, web-based password generators. These are all JavaScript copy pasted right into the slides. So here's an example of a generator that's using an insecure random number generator and they're doing so not uniformly. So if you don't read source code, that's okay. I'm gonna walk you through it. It's not too painful. So we have this variable E that we're uh, adding all of our uppercase characters to and then we're also appending the lowercase characters, the digits, and then some special characters the length of that string E ends up becoming 85 characters in length, okay? So we have an 85 character long variable E. Then I've got two for loops. <clears throat> the outer for loop is actually gen generating a number of passwords that I request. 
If I say, give me 10 passwords, that's what this outer for loop is doing. It'll say, all right, here's your first one, here's your second, all the way through your 10th. The inner for loop is actually constructing each individual password. It's building the password itself um, before moving out to the next, the next one. And then, which is interesting, is this generator was putting everything in a text area, and so they're appending the carriage return and the new line at the end of the password. Uh, so in the text area, each password that you request uh, is one right after the other, rather than all in one long string line, okay? So why is it insecure and why is it biased? Well, first off, it's insecure because it's using math.random. Math.random is not a cryptographically secure random number generator. And when we're generating secrets, in this case passwords, for authentication websites, we want them to be indistinguishable from true random white noise data. And that's what cryptographically secure random number generators provide for me. Math.random is not that. So if I observe enough of math.random's output, I can predict all future output. So for a password generator, this is not a good idea. Second, math.random is actually a 32-bit random number generator. And it turns out that 85 does not divide 2 to the 32 evenly. There's a remainder, in this case, a remainder of 1. So that means that not everything is going to get treated equally. If I were to generate 0 through 84, I would get 0 one more time than I would 1 through 84 as I'm working all the way up to 2 to the 32nd power, okay, when I'm doing mod 85 arithmetic. So in this generator-specific case, that uppercase A is going to get favored more than the rest of the characters in the password. Now, it's, it's, it's favored by one. I'll admit that. And when you're generating billions of passwords, I mean, the law of averages shows that is this really that big of a concern? When it comes to cryptography and security, yes, actually it is. Everything needs to be as uniform as possible. We should not be able to give any adversary an advantage in being able to predict or make guesses at what the output is going to be. <clears throat> so we don't like this. And they're doing that. I'm going to go back a slide. If you look at the code right in the center, m plus equals e dot carat, <clears throat> they're doing math.floor of math.random times the length. Math.random gives you a random number between 0 and 1, not excluding 1, okay? And because it's a 32-bit random number generator, that means there's 2 to the 32 possible decimal values between 0, including 0, and 1 exclusively. So when I times it by 85, I could get 27.639 something. So we take the floor of that, even though it's 27.6, we don't round up. We take the floor and I get 27, and then I say give me the character at 27th position in E, okay? So this, what's called the uh, multiply and floor method is a biased way of picking random data. Okay, let's look at an insecure but uniform approach. This comes from one where the guy was using your mouse as a source of entropy. You would wiggle your mouse across the screen, a little bar would grow and grow and grow until it's green, and then you can click generate and generate your password. So as this function get random number, that max variable is how many characters are in our string. So previously it would have been 85. And then we have this variable bits needed. And he's determining how many bits need to store that number. So in the case of 85, let's use that as an example, um, six bits can get me up to 63, right? Zero to 63, I can represent 64 possible values with six bits. Seven bits though, I can represent 128 values. So for, if max was 85, then bits needed would be seven. I need seven bits to represent all 85 possible values, right? So now we're going to go ahead and get one bit at a time with this little function called get random bit. And we're going to expand that bit by multiplying it by two and then adding the new bit on the end, okay? It's very simple uh, math in this regard. Where it becomes uniform 
is if that random number is greater than or equal to the max value, in this case 85, if the result comes out as 86 or 87, then we discard it and we try again. So we're only going to allow values that come between 0 and 84 as valid. So that's where we're getting our uniform. But what's unfortunate about this is even though he's using it uniformly, um, and you would think using mouse movement as entropy would be secure, uh, we can get into the details of this after the talk if you want, but physical sources of randomness need to be whitened or decorrelated before they're put in use. They need to be debiased. It's unfortunate, but physical sources of randomness have a tendency to skew one way or the other. It's just the way nature kind of behaves. So we need to remove that skewing. And we could do that with a simple hash. We could hash it with SHA-256. That would certainly be appropriate. Uh, John von Neumann, the computer scientist of the 50s, invented an algorithm um, where you can remove bias out of unfair coin tosses called the von Neumann debiasing algorithm. We could apply that. He's doing it one bit at a time. That would certainly be appropriate. Uh, but there are different approaches just so long as we debias that true input. So if we had, had decorrelated the mouse movement and then applied it, it would have been secure. Here's another piece of code. This is a secure random number generator, but doing so biasedly. I don't know if that's a word, not uniformly. So he's using the Web Crypto API, and right there in the top we have this function O, and we're setting a, a variable C to either be window.crypto or window.ms crypto. Before Microsoft brought Chromium into the Edge browser, uh, and they were using their own engine, I think it was Chakra, maybe? Don't quote me on that. Uh, and Internet Explorer 11 and earlier, they had their own version of the Web Crypto API via the window.ms crypto object. So we're ensuring we catch everybody, either Firefox, Chrome browsers, or early Microsoft uh, with that variable. And then we're creating a 32-bit unsigned integer array, and we're assigning just one space for it. And then we're using the get random values function, which is cryptographically secure because it's coming from that web crypto API to populate it. And then we're returning it divided by two to the 32. So I want a number between zero and one. So it's kind of behaving like math.random in that regard. Instead of giving me a number like 15,612, I'm getting 0 0.416 or whatever. And then there's my variable t with my characters. And then finally in that for loop towards the bottom of the slide, we can see that he's using, again, the multiply and floor method. He's doing math.floor of my cryptographically secure function, which returns a random number, times the length of t. In this specific case, he is using crypto.getRandomValues. That's cryptographically secure. That's good. But he's using the multiply and floor method, which is a biased approach. Just like earlier, 90 does not divide 2 to the 32 evenly. In fact, there are 76 remainders. So we end up with, uh, well, in this case, because of the 90, the length of our string, we end up with those outputs being favored over everybody else. Again, observing the output, I can see we have some favored characters in my password versus some unfavored characters. We don't want this. Final example. Here is a secure and uniform example. This is the golden standard. This is what we're chasing after. This is what we want. So again, we, are, we have this function called uniform. n is the number of characters in my string, or a max number, if you will, like give me a number between 0 and n. Uh, then we're instantiating a new 32-bit unsigned integer array in the variable a. And then n, we're forcing it to be a 32-bit number. So that's kind of some JavaScript uh, bit manipulation fun, but if n was larger than 2 to the 32, this would force it into that space. Okay? And then we have this do while loop, and I'm saying give me a random number and populate it in my array 
so long as it's less than m. So what is m? m is a minimum value. And if you were to run that code in your browser, um, it would be the same as taking uh, 2 to the 32 mod n. We're looking for a remainder, and then we're setting that as my lowest value. Okay. So what I'm ensuring then, if I come to my next slide, is that m to 2 to the 32 will always get evenly divided by n. There will be no remainders. n will always divide that range perfectly evenly. So I'm not going to have any biased output. I'm not going to have any favored numbers, any favored characters. And it doesn't matter what n is. n can be completely variable. We will always get uniform output. So in the case of this example, this was building a Diceware passphrase. Diceware contains 7,776 unique words. So n is 7,776. When I apply that math there on the third line, or the fourth line, m equals negative n, bit shifts to the right, zero mod n, I end up with 2560. So this becomes my minimum value. So when I'm generating random numbers, they have to be between 2560 and 2 to the 32 minus 1. Otherwise, I have to regenerate. But if it falls within that range, I know it'll divide 7,776 evenly. I can go ahead and take that result mod 7776, and I will get a uniform output. And what's great about this is you would think with that minimum, with those 2560 numbers that we're rejecting, that's kind of going to hang up the generator, right? Like, how many times am I going to be rejecting numbers because they didn't fall within that range? Well, 2560 is 0.00006% of 2 to the 32. So effectively, it's not going to happen. You're not going to notice it. All right. So that was just looking at cryptographically secure versus insecure generators and whether or not it's uniform. But I began noticing in the audit, seeing and from my early market research, that there are generators that want to generate it on the server and then send it to me over HTTPS, over a TLS connection, instead of doing it in the client. It usually forces a browser refresh or a new post to the server, but the server is doing the generation, not the browser. And I can't audit that. I can't look at the source code that's running on the server, unless it's open source and on a GitHub repo or somewhere else. I can't look at that source code. I can't see what random number generator it's using. And I can't see if it's using it uniformly, right? So it's completely unknown to me. It's a black box. I don't know how the randomness is being handled. I was also came across password generators that would do deterministic generation, deterministically generate your password. This is usually built from a master password. You would come up with something in your head, you know, maybe like your mother's maiden name or something. And then you would also supply like a username or an email address or a domain, something, and you would put these together in a form field and click generate my password. And it gets hashed with a hashing function and then spits out the result. And as long as you provide the same parameters, you'll always get the same output. Um, I have some issues with deterministic generators though. First off, they can't accommodate different password policies without keeping state. I don't know how many of you guys are fans of Bruce Snyder, the security expert. I follow his blog. Recently, he blogged a frustration where his password manager generated a password for him for a site, and he went to supply it, and the site rejected it because it did not contain two numbers. It only had one. And so he was frustrated with password policies that are, seem ambiguous and arbitrary. You can't do password policy, password policy, blah, blah, blah. you cannot accommodate different password policies with deterministic generators without keeping state. If it doesn't provide the policy, you'll need a counter or you'll need to be able to fiddle with your username or change the domain in some way so it gives you a different output that does match that policy. But then you have to remember the state the next time you need to regenerate it in the future. You can't handle uh, breached passwords. Have I been pwned is a thing. 
Passwords getting stored in plain text is a thing. Getting password cracked is a thing. If you get an alert from Google that your password has been breached and you're using a deterministic generator, you need some sort of counter, some sort of state to change that password, right? You need some variable in order to give you a new password. And you can't do that without keeping state. And further, and I think the worst fatal flaw, is if the master password is exposed and the adversary is aware of your system for generating passwords, then all of your prior passwords are now breached. He doesn't even need knowledge of what they are because he has the core secret, which is your master password. So these are, these are some concerns of mine, at least, with deterministic password generators. But further, most people will deterministically use fast hashing functions, like MD5 or SHA-1 or SHA-2, when in reality, they probably should be using slow hashing functions, like password-based key derivation functions. The reason is, let's assume, that the adversary does know my system, but doesn't know my master password. He knows the approach I use, he's just trying to figure out my master password, trying to figure out my secret. If the generator is using MD5, then he can work through those guesses quickly. But if the generator is using something like PBKDF2, or Scrypt, or Argon2, these are things that are designed deliberately to be slow with cost factors, then we can slow down that brute force attack. We can prevent the adversary from being effective without spending more money, distributing his workload, that sort of thing. Um, and I should, this is a little nitpick that I put in the, the final uh, bullet point on the slide. Um, key derivation functions are more appropriate in this specific use case than password hashing functions. There's a subtle difference. Password hashing functions give you a static output, like bcrypt or SHA-512 crypt, like we use at Xmission. Um, SHA-512 crypt gives you 512 bits of output, and that's just static, and that's how it is. But with key derivation functions, I can say I want 160 bits or 256 bits or 512. I can be completely variable in how much data I want returned from the function. So in the case of a deterministic password generator, we don't need a lot of bits. We're only generating, what, 12, 16-character password strings. We don't need these massively large things. So I can restrict this down to 70 bits, 80 bits, 90 bits of output. Um, rather than taking 512 and then truncating them. All right, what about security margins? Talked a little bit about that earlier. If I go back to that cluster of eight NVIDIA GPUs that Jeremy Gosney has, um, can I make reasonable assumptions about bit strength? And I think I can. So remember, I'm trying to make a password generator that is not messy. It's clean in the UI and it's easy to understand for the layperson. I don't want to confuse them. So when it comes to bits, that is maybe a necessary evil, but I don't want to go 55, 56, 57, 58. I think every five bits is perfectly fine for the layperson. So in terms of that NTLM Hashing, password hashing, <clears throat> 55 bits is exhausted in 20 hours. So I think anything less than a day will probably be considered broken. 60 bits gets us 26 days, it's a month. I consider that weak because it only takes a couple people to decide to join in and help. Uh, that can significantly lower that time. But as we move every five bits, we can see that full exhaustion of that key space gets exponentially longer. 65 bits is at three years, 70 bits is at 73 years, and so forth. So I decided, and I am completely open to debate on this, that because 60 bits might take a little bit of work, takes a month on an individual person or to get a team together to lower that threshold, we could consider that weak. 65 bits moderate because it would take more of a distributed clustered attack to really bring that within a workable manner. 
But I think 70 bits and above, in terms of password security, we could consider strong. That's certainly a good market or a good point to reach for. So here's just a quick table. I'm going to go through this quickly. But in the columns, I have the unique characters in each set. So 10 characters would be my digits, 26 would be the alphabet, 52 would be lowercase, uppercase, 94 would be every graphical ASCII character on my keyboard. And then the rows are my bit strengths. So how many characters would I need in my password based on the characters in the set and the bit strength? So for 94 characters, if I wanted to hit 70 bits of security, I would need at least an 11 character password, okay, randomly generated. What's interesting about this table, however, is how many sites do you see when you're creating a new account that they say your password must be at least eight characters, right? And that means, as we are well aware, everyone will create an eight character password. They won't go longer if they don't have to, but do you see eight anywhere on that table, right? We already considered 55 bits broken. And if it's using all 94 graphical ASCII characters on my keyboard, I need at least nine to get to 55 bits. Eight's not even on the radar. So it would be great if any of you are web developers, this is just a cry, if any of you are out there, it would be great to see us maybe bump that up to 10 or 11 or 12 as a minimum. Because you know the users are going to pick that. You say 12, they're, they're doing 12. They're not going to do 13 if they don't have to. But if they are using their password generator in their manager or somewhere else, then we know what that security looks like, right? And we know what it looks like for eight characters. Same thing with passphrase security. Here's a number of unique words in a set versus my bits. Um, notice at 55 bits for 16,384 unique words, I can get four words. How many are familiar with the XKCD comic of correct horse battery staple, right? Generate four random words, good enough. That's fine, but four is 55 bits of security if your word list has 16,384 unique words and it was generated uniformly and securely, but we already decided that 55 is broken. So XKCD, Randall Monroe, kind of hit the right tone in terms of memorability, but the execution was sloppy. Four random words just isn't enough. Right? We need to move past that. So to recap, really quickly, um, we started late. I'm going to run a little bit late. I apologize to the next presenter, but I'm moving fast. Uh, a secured password generator then can be defined as being generated in the client, not on the server. If it is deterministic, it's using a proper key derivation function with a cost factor. If it's random, it's using a cryptographically secure number generator uniformly and we're defaulting to at least 70 bits of security. All right. Yes, I'm completely judging you. So let's go further. Are there any other security concerns we can take about? That's all the math, right? That's all the big rocks. What about some of the littler rocks? Well, I think it should be obvious that the page needs to be delivered over TLS. Plain HTTP opens up the user to injection attacks. What's to prevent? a man in the middle from compromising the entire security of the password generator system. Ads and JavaScript trackers in the web page also compromise the secrecy of the password generation process. Right? These things are trying to track you across the web. They're trying to build profiles of who you are. So if these exist in the password generator, it may already know details about who you are, the social accounts you have, you know, and here we are now generating a password on this password generator. Um, it just shouldn't be something that they need to know. Sub-resource integrity is a standard by the W3C where it guarantees that if you're calling a resource from a third-party server externally on the internet, that when it gets delivered, it gets delivered as you expect. And so there's this integrity attribute in either an image tag, a link tag, or a script tag with a integrity hash, either SHA-256, SHA-384, or SHA-512. And when that resource comes off of that third-party server, like the image, the browser then can quickly hash the image and see if it matches what's in the HTML. If it does, we're good to go. If not, the browser will complain and not give you the requested resource. 
Usability concerns. Do we have a mobile interface? Right? Mobile is a thing now. It should be no surprise that we should have mobile interfaces on our web pages. Is the source code open source? Right? People like me who are auditing these password generators and see legitimate flaws can patch it up and send patches to the developer. But if it's not open source, if I'm restricted on my ability to use the software, I can't make those improvements. Is there anything else worth noting? Comments, like is it stable? Does it perform well? Okay. So this is a lot to audit. So I decided to do a simple scoring system out of 10. And I gave you one point for each of those items. You get a point if it's open source, you get a point if it's generated in the client, a point if it's random, not deterministic, if it's using a cryptographically secure random number generator, uniformly HTTPS, mobile interface, no trackers, and we're using or not requiring SRI. That's nine out of the 10. For the 10th point, I look at the security margin. If it's less than 55 bits, no points. But if it's between 55 and 69, I give you half a point. And if you reach that 70 bit security margin or better, I give you a full point. And this is by default, I should mention. I'm not deliberately trying to make your generator weak, just saying what is delivered to the user so when he clicks generate without mucking with anything, uh, what do we get? So that left me now with what to audit. So I started just searching, and we've got passwords, passphrases, Chrome extensions, Firefox extensions, and bookmarklets. And I'm going to pick on a couple people. I hope he's not watching. Taylor Hornby, some of you may know him as DiffuseSec on Twitter, security researcher, well known, has a Windows password generator. You can go to that website, diffuse.ca, passgen.htm, and download the Windows generator. But on that page, he also has up in the header a big web-based password generator. And here's a screenshot of it. Just want a password? Copy and paste these or refresh the page to generate a new set. So let's hold Taylor's, Taylor up to those security standards that we just defined, okay? If we're auditing his web-based generator, he scores seven out of 10. This is what he does well. It's random, not deterministic. He's using a cryptographically secure random number generator. I'll talk about more in a second. He's doing it uniformly over HTTPS. The default security margin is 256 bits, which in my opinion is overkill, but that's fine, point. There's no ads or JavaScript trackers, and he doesn't use or need sub-resource integrity. But where he could improve is even though the web source code is on GitHub, he doesn't have an explicit license defined. Now, I don't know about Canada copyright law, but in the United States, if you don't explicitly define a license, then it is copyright you, all rights reserved. It's not open source, it is proprietary. So until a license is there, unfortunately, it's proprietary software. Also, it's PHP, it's not JavaScript. So this is being done on the server and he's sending it to you through HTTPS. And then finally, he's missing a mobile, a mobile interface. Let's look at Bitwarden. I mentioned that. Let's pick one of the heavier hitters, Bitwarden. In this case, I'm showing off the passphrase generator. Interestingly enough, their passphrase generator is weaker than their password generator by default. Well, look at that. They also get seven out of 10. They do well, it's generated in the client, not the server. It's random, not deterministic. They're using a cryptographically secure random number generator. Uniformly, HTTPS. They have a mobile interface and they don't need sub-resource integrity. Where they could improve, their web source code is nowhere to be found, which is weird because the Android and the iOS clients and the desktop clients and everything else is on GitHub except for their password generator. The source code just doesn't exist other than getting delivered to your browser. Also, the default security for the passphrases is 51 bits, but for the passwords, it's 83. So for the password generator, he scores eight out of 10, but for the passphrase, we get seven out of 10. And then finally, it does have JavaScript trackers. I would have expected better out of Bitwarden, but they do have that on the website. So now we come back to my generator, and this is a screenshot, kind of a bad one. Um, if you go to my URL, a7.st slash g, a7st is my amateur radio call sign, so I just bought the .st domain, slash g for generator, but this is what I ended up coming with. The default, there's my security margins on the top, 
And then I have a bunch of different generators, all of them meeting that security margin that you select. It defaults to 70, and all you have to do is click generate, copy and paste it, and you're good to go. So how do I do? Probably not very fair. I am the guy who's doing the auditing, right? I am the guy who's defining the standard. But I guess that's just how the cookie crumbles. But I did score a perfect uh, 10 out of 10. But I did design my generator after the standard rather than defining, defining the standard after the generator. So I can be honest about that. Um, all right, the current audit status, I'll show a quick screenshot. I've currently audited 209 password generators, 89 passphrase, 114 Chrome extensions, 36 Firefox extensions, and 20 bookmarklets. You can go to that tiny URL, it's a Google spreadsheet, and see the status of every single one of them. Their URLs will be there, you can click on them and play around with them, uh, tinyurl.com slash generator audit. Um, one quick note, extensions score seven out of seven, uh, and when you look at the audit, you'll see why. But here is a screenshot of the passwords tab of first part of the audit anyway. And you can see the score on the left, it's kind of small. Perfect 10 out of 10s get our color blue, nine green, uh, eight through I think it's six or five are yellow, and then below that is red. And then on the right, the green and the red and the yellow, you can see uh, how they scored, right? Greens are a point, red are zero point. Uh, the yellows might be a half point, it depends. And then there's notes on the side. All right, final topic. I apologize for running late to the next presenter. Web, web applications are actually super dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Why? So. Even though my password generator that I built has a perfect 10 out of 10, and many others do as well, you're all, we're all trusting on the web server to deliver that code correctly. What is preventing a disgruntled web administrator for sending JavaScript on a page refresh that compromises the entire stack? Nothing, right? It could be a perfect 10 out of 10. Everything's done great, and all it takes is one disgruntled web admin to say, screw it, I want a log of all the passwords, so I am sending this JavaScript on the next page refresh. You don't know that unless every time you refresh the page, you're inspecting the source code. This is why desktop apps minimize that vulnerability, because they're strongly versioned, they're compiled. Until you update to the newest version, you know if you've audited it, at least, or trust someone who has, you know that what you're using is what you expect, okay, until you update again. Um, that's not the case with web apps. Anytime you hit that F5, you get a new version. You could get a new version of the software. So despite doing everything perfectly, these web-based generators are still vulnerable to this sort of attack. All right, and that is all I've got. Sorry I went through it quickly and we started late. Are there any comments, questions, or rude remarks? Oh, all right, thanks guys. <laughs>